What up? Crazy Yates on the tracks, gonna get back. Shout out to all my 92354ers out there. Bring the beat in. The last will be first and the first will be mad If you can't swim, if you're scared of sharks Flood is coming, get on Noah's boat When Daniel prayed there were bad men They threw Daniel in the lion's house Nick knack paddywhack, give the dog a bone This old man came rolling fast Okay, we got the blankets Napkins We've got the big school picnic today. I'm so excited. I bought a new William and Sonoma picnic set. We've been spending a little too much money lately. Golf, ballet. Shoes, dog yoga. 20 acres on Mars. Hey, that could make us rich someday, or our kids, or their kids. All right, I got the baseball gloves, the frisbee. Rollerblades. Has anybody seen the pogo stick? Rollerblades, Dad. Seriously, that's embarrassing. What? Are you really gonna go out in these shorts? I thought I was cool. I mean, I own part of Mars. Exactly, honey. And socks and sandals? Really? They help my feet get the perfect amount of ventilation. See, I told you that wasn't cool. See, Mom's just a little frumpy. She doesn't frumpy? even- I'm frumpy? That's what Uncle Tim said. Yeah, but frumpy's normal for a mom. But you guys are kind of lame. Oh yeah, says the guy with the minion slippers watching TV on mute. It's Crazy 8. He's cool. This music's awful, so I keep it on mute. Wow. Yeah, keep it on mute. It was time to make a change. Time to be cool, parents. Shut the fridge, Jack be Babe, I'm taking you shopping. Really? Shabuya! Yeah, go be cool in your minivan. Also, can I borrow it later? Guys, don't forget to get Cheetos. Cheetos. Ugh. the end of the world, right? So this one is called a machete. machete. What is going on? Uh, I'm showing them my apocalyptic survival kit. Boys, go get ready for the park. Tim, don't you think they're a little young for that? Aren't you guys a little old for that? Tim. Point Magazine. Don't look at me. The Best of Ballet. I can cancel my subscription. Wait, we don't have any more money? Well, your mom made some bad decisions. Land so... on Mars? I made some worse ones. Months of spending for Will and Claire spent so much money, they don't even have any left. We had to take back all that cool stuff. Well, most. Hey, I couldn't find the receipt for these. We just wanted to be hip and cool and be our kid's friend. <laughs> but sometimes you have to be the parent. You gotta make sure you take care of your kids. Uh, part of being a parent is having the opportunity to embarrass your kids. 
<laughs> Which, let's be honest, isn't that hard. Mm -mm. <laughs> Alrighty, who's ready for some family fun? You got your mom jeans on, babe? You know it. <laughs> Those hip hop pants were weird. I don't even know if I put them on right. Seriously, it was like 106 degrees. What were we doing wearing sweats? Why can't life be simple? There may be many answers to that question, but I'll tell you one answer, and that answer is money. Money tends to complicate things, whether you have it or whether you don't. It's like the late Fred Craddock said. He said there are two kinds of people who obsess about money, those who have it and those who don't. Money can tend to complicate things. I mean, just think about the couple that we just saw. I suspect there's somebody here in this sanctuary today who knows that story and who knows it well. You're living large with the credit cards, and then suddenly in the mail, there they come. They stack up. And once you look at all of those bills, you think, have mercy. What happened? Why can't life be simple? Well, the truth is, sometimes money complicates things. I suspect there's a single person here today who just started dating somebody. You like the individual. In fact, your increasingly special person just gave you a gift, a nice gift, a really nice gift. And as you look at that gift and as you consider what it cost, your question is, what strings are attached to this gift? Things just got a little complicated. Why can't life be simple? Well, sometimes it's because of money. Money can make things more complicated. I think about the fact that some read about those who win the lottery and think, wow, if I suddenly became rich, if I suddenly became a multimillionaire, life would then be simple. I ran across these words written just in July of last year by Rob Kramer who wrote, Money isn't always the answer to all of life's problems. In fact, sometimes money can create even more problems, as it seems is often the case for lottery winners. It's not uncommon for lottery winners to end up with less than they had before their windfall and sometimes to even end up with nothing at all. Why is this? One of the main reasons is a lack of financial planning and foolhardy spending habits linked to an inability to manage such enormous and unexpected spending power. For example, at 16 years of age, Callie was the youngest person ever to win the lottery in the United Kingdom, and her inexperience was sadly evident in the way she managed her money. Today, she has nowhere near the 1.9 million pounds she was awarded in 2003 when she was just 16 years old. She blew the money on plastic surgery, drugs, and parties. Now 26, Rogers says she is much happier in studying nursing. Her wealth drove her to despair, she has since reported, and at her lowest point, she even attempted suicide. As of last year, her net worth totaled no more than 2,000 pounds. Money can complicate life. Sometimes it's having money that complicates life. Sometimes it's not having money that complicates life. But the reality is sometimes it's not so simple. In fact, in 2012, a national survey, telephone survey, asking people across this country a variety of different questions, found out some interesting things about money. Found out, for example, that of all of the issues about which couples argue and fight, and there are many of them, in-laws and sexuality and chores and work and all of those kinds of things, at the very top of the list was, you guessed it, money. In fact, the survey determined that the average couple has three fights about money every month. Three fights every month. As they age, couples tend to argue more about money. 49% of their arguments are about unexpected expenses. 32% of their arguments are about insufficient savings. They also discovered that 30% of people, 30% of us, they said, 
has acted, shall we say, deceptively with a spouse. Nothing major, just, you know, hiding what we just bought so that they don't see it. 30% of us. Their final discovery was that 55% of couples say they do not schedule any time to talk just about money. Now, when I read that last piece, I thought I can understand that. If it's the number one cause of conflict, no wonder they don't schedule time to talk about money. Why? Because, well, money can make things complicated. It represents so many things. It, represent, it represents power and choices. It represents work. It represents hope. It represents, well, you just could continue the list. It represents many things. So sometimes having it complicates things. Sometimes not having it complicates things. I wondered why that is. This last week, as I was reading things about money, I ran across something that may give us the reason as to why money complicates things. It's called Billings Law. I don't know if you've ever run across Billings Law, but this is what Billings Law says. Make certain you live within your means, even if you have to borrow to do so. <laughs> Make certain of that. That's Billings Law. I ran across another person who said, don't loan money to a friend because it damages their memory. <laughs> they suddenly can't remember. Money complicates things. Now, the reality is most of us would like to have a life that is as free from complications, at least unnecessary complications, as possible. So is there any way through all of this? Well, I want to take you to a passage of Scripture that I think gives us some insight into why it complicates things and maybe some insight into the direction to go to make them more simple. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6, page 1444 in your pew Bible, today's New International Version. As we come to Matthew, the 6th chapter, we are landing right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Right here at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount is a key passage that we're going to read today. Now, you'll notice something interesting about the passage. The passage does not mention money. And yet the reality is the themes which it does speak of are themes that have a great deal to do with not only our material possessions but with our money. It is in this passage that Jesus is going to make the suggestion that we have the option of having one of two kinds of lives. We can, on the one hand, have a life that is based on worry. If we have a life that is based on worry, it's going to be a complicated life. On the other hand, he's going to say we could have a life that is based on trust. If we have a life that is based on trust, our life is going to be greatly simplified. Now, with those two options before us, I'm going to make a guess. I'm going to guess that if I were to have the opportunity to ask every person in this congregation today, which one would you prefer, worry with complications or trust with simplicity, I would guess that to a person, people would say, I want trust with simplicity. And yet the reality is many of us don't live there. Why is that? What choices are we making to lead us in a different direction than where we may wish to be? I think, in fact, Jesus in this passage will point us towards some mistakes that are easy to make that move us in the wrong direction. So let's read the passage. You're not going to find the word money. In fact, you're not even going to find the word trust, even though trust is woven into the fabric of the thought of the passage. What you will find is the word worry. Just notice how many times the word worry appears in the passage. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away, store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor is dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field 
which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus lays out two possibilities in life. One road, one possibility, is living the kind of life that is based on worry, a kind of complicated life about all of these questions about how things will be provided. That's one possibility. The other possibility, he, he says, is a life based on trust, a much more simple possibility. My question is, why is it that while many of us want that more simple life that is based on trust, how do we end up on this other road? This other journey, characterized by worry and complication. Well, Jesus, I would suggest, points us to at least three mistakes that we can make that will move us down the wrong road. Three mistakes. The first mistake is this. First reason some people end up worrying rather than trusting is that they make a mistake about what is truly important. They make a mistake about what is truly important. Notice verse 25 again. Therefore I tell you, Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Then pay attention to the question he asks. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Here's what Jesus appears to be thinking. He's saying, I, I know you're worried about a lot of things, but let me ask you a question. Isn't your body more important than food, your life more important than clothes? Well, think about this. God is the one who made that which is most important, your body. He's the one who's given you your life. He has shaped you, formed you, breathed into you the breath of life. That is what is truly important. Since he has given you what is truly important, can you not trust him for what is also important but less so? Can you not trust that he will provide for your deepest needs? If he gives you what's most important, won't he give you what's also important? Jesus is trying to drive us to thinking about what really matters in life and make certain that we value the real thing of importance. You see, if we turn that upside down and we begin to value the things of life, the food, the clothes, all of those realities of life as a means to experience value and, and wholeness and a sense of purpose and belonging and acceptance, it becomes a very slippery slope. When I depend on those realities to give my life meaning, then I have to pay whatever price is required to achieve those things. I become very vulnerable to the voices in the society and culture around me who are saying to me, buy, 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 because that's your way to achieve meaning and significance and value in life. Many of us make that mistake, that mistake of not understanding what is truly important. In modern-day America, it's a surefire road into debt, into significant debt. And there is nothing that will complicate our lives more than debt we cannot manage. And for many, that is driven by not understanding that which is most important and that the one who gave us that which is most important can also help provide for other things, provide for meaning and significance and value. Suze Orman is a woman who has written quite a bit about financial matters. She tells the story of having been in Mexico on one occasion, walking through apparently what was a marketplace, and as she was walking through, she spied something that got her attention. There was a merchant there who was selling birds, had some birds, I guess, in cages, but had some large parrots that were perched on a perch 
And she looked at them and looked fairly carefully and realized they weren't tied down. They weren't in cages. In fact, as far as she could see, there was nothing that was keeping them there. So she walked over to the man. She, had, she said to him, so, so, so do these birds love you so much that they won't fly away? And he kind of laughed and said, oh, no, no. I've trained them. Really? Yeah, I've trained them. Well, what do you mean you've trained them? Well, he says, it's almost impossible to do with the smaller birds. They, they, they just won't learn it. But with the larger birds, I can train them. I can train them that this perch is their safety. It is their security. And so when they sit on this perch, they grab on, they hold on for all they're worth, and they will not leave, even though they're free, even though they can fly. Orman listened to that. Then I want to read to you in her own words what she thought next. She says, Suddenly a light bulb went off in my head. We're just like those poor parents. We have been taught to clutch our money as tightly as we can, as if our money is the perch of our safety and security. Just like those parents, we have all forgotten how free we really are, with or without the perch. The more afraid we are, the tighter we hold on, and the more we have trapped ourselves. Free to fly. But I'm holding on to this. This is the most important thing in my life. Jesus says, that's a mistake. Yes, physical things have value, have meaning. Money is not the problem. It's how we manage, how we handle, how we think about it that can become problematic or complicated. So the first mistake people can make, Jesus says, is not understanding what is truly a value. What is most important? But there's a second mistake. Not only is it a mistake to misunderstand what's truly important, but secondly, Jesus says, those who want to live that simple life of trust but end up living the complicated life of worry also make the mistake of misplacing their priorities. Not just misunderstanding of what's most important, but also misunderstanding their priorities. Back to Matthew chapter 6. This time I want you to notice verse 33. Jesus says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness. Seek first. In other words, there is a list of priorities. Jesus says, make certain that your top priority is God, is his kingdom. Because the mistake of misplaced priorities can really mess things up. Now, the people to whom Jesus was speaking could certainly have understood that. They lived in a very different society and culture to the one in which we live. Listen to New Testament scholar Craig Keener as he writes about this reality. He writes, most people in antiquity had little beyond basic necessities, food, clothing, shelter, because their acquisition of these necessities often depended, especially in rural areas, on seasonal rain. Or in Egypt, the flooding of the Nile. They had plenty of cause for stress, even about food and clothing. You catch that last line? They had plenty of cause for stress, even about food and clothing. Just think of how different your life, how different my life would be. If this were the case, suppose that whether or not we had supper tonight, whether or not our family had breakfast tomorrow morning, it all depended on what we did today. If we had a productive day, if we worked hard, if we managed to make enough to go to the marketplace and buy some food for supper, buy some food for breakfast, then we could bring something home, give to our family, we could all eat. But if things didn't go well, if we couldn't find that job right now, no food tonight, there's no refrigerator. There's no real way of preserving it. So the people to whom Jesus is speaking, they know that constant temptation for stress. Where's my next meal coming from? What am I going to cover myself with on the cold night? Constant stress. And yet it is to these people that Jesus speaks and says, 
seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, make that your highest priority. That's a pretty tall order to consider that I would make that my highest priority. It would have to be based on the trust that he will provide. Jesus says two options, life based on worry, life based on trust. Place God as the top priority, a life based on trust is what you'll experience. We all have to make those kinds of choices about what our priorities will be. For example, the journal Fast Company asked its readers a question. They said, we're going to give you an option. You can get one of two things. We want to know which one you would choose. You can either get an extra hour a day at home with your family, doing your hobby, resting, whatever you want to do, an extra hour a day, every day for the next year at home. Or you can get a $10,000 raise for the year. One or the other. Which will you choose? They were interested to know what the readers of their journal would choose, just as I'm interested to know what you would choose. I don't know if you're willing to take the risk, but I'm going to ask the question. So which would it be? I want to see how many of you would be willing to raise your hands. Okay, first option. I would take an extra hour at home over the next year. Use as I please. Extra hour at home. How many of you say that would be my choice? I would take the hour. Let's see the hands. All right, we've got some hands. Look at that. We've got a fair number of hands. All right, very good. I appreciate that. Now, how many of you would say, I would take this year the extra 10 grand? Let me see your hands. Uh-huh. Now we're seeing the hands. Yes, sir. We had a gentleman first service who stood up in the back and waved. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, how many of you didn't vote? <laughs> there are a few of those as well. Interesting to see. Now, the readers of the journal Fast Company, they said, 83% of them said, I would take the 10 grand. 17% said, I would take the extra hour. But here's the point. Neither one of those is necessarily right or wrong. You're making a choice based on what the realities of your life are right now. You're making a choice of which priority comes first. That's the kind of choice Jesus is seeking to drive us toward. Make a choice, he says, and when you make that choice, make sure that at the top of the list, God, his kingdom, his righteousness, and all that that implies. A researcher down at University of Southern California, Richard Easterlin, did a research project over about an 18-year period. Researched and asked uh, people for these years questions that would help him understand what it was that drove them and what kind of satisfaction it brought to them. Reporting on businessday.com, he says, these are some of the discoveries that I made in the project. Many people are under the illusion that the more money we make, the happier we'll be. We put all of our resources into making money at the expense of our family and our health. The problem is we don't realize that our material wants increase with the amount of money we make. The study discovered happiness was related to quality time with loved ones, good health, being friendly, having an optimistic outlook, exercising self-control, and possessing a deep sense of ethics. In other words, whatever amount you make, whether it's a large amount or a small amount, the true happiness that you will experience comes from the deeper realities of who you are as a person, from the deeper realities of that deep sense of ethics that he talks about. That is informed somewhere, Jesus would say, that is informed by the Spirit of God and by placing God first. It will be here in Matthew's Gospel that Matthew will talk about some of the things we ought to remember, such as in Matthew 25 when he says, don't forget the least of these. That's part of what comes with placing God as the top priority. So Jesus talks to people who are used to having to, to scratch and to work and to do everything they can just to try to survive, and he says, seek first. He speaks to us. Those of us who make a good living, 
make a good wage, and he says, seek first. So how do we end up off the path of trust and simplicity? Well, Jesus said we make some mistakes. First of all, we misunderstand what's truly important. Secondly, we misplace our priorities. And thirdly, he says, we miss living in this moment. We miss living in this moment. Back to Matthew chapter 6, this time to the last verse in the chapter, verse 34. Jesus finishes off by saying, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow, he says. Stay with, live in today. Keep your focus on the here and the now. We say it in our day and time by saying, live one day at a time. Who wasn't it? Wasn't it Macbeth who said tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow? Creeps in a day at a time, leading us in the way toward dusty death. Tomorrow. But Jesus says, no, not tomorrow, today. I want you to live in this moment in time. When I was studying marriage and family therapy, one of our professors said something in class one day that stuck with me. He said, most of us tend to live regretfully in the past or anxiously in the future. Regretfully in the past or anxiously in the future. He says, either one of those keeps us from living fully in this moment of time. Jesus could have said it that way. He could have said, we're, we're, we're forgetting to live in the here and now, the one gift that God has given us because of our regrets or because of our fears. Rather than that, live, he says, with trust in a heavenly Father who has his eye on every sparrow. Live with an attitude of trust. The late Henry Nouwen, in, in a fine little volume called Making All Things New, writes about such things. He writes about how we, he uses the word, preoccupy ourselves with things in the future that we cannot control. And then he breaks down the word. Very simple, but I hadn't thought of it before. He said, just think about the word itself. Preoccupied. He said to be preoccupied is to be occupied with something before we get there. That's to be preoccupied. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with somebody who is preoccupied? Their mind is somewhere else. Their eyes have a faraway look. They say to you things like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm listening, I'm listening. But you know they're not listening. They are preoccupied. How easy it is to be preoccupied. We're busy planning our funeral before the test from the doctor's office have even come back. Preoccupied. We're busy wondering about what it'll be like when the plane goes down before we've even boarded the flight. We're busy wondering what we're going to do when we fail boards and we haven't taken the test. Preoccupied. Now the question becomes, how does this touch our finances? I would suggest that it absolutely does, and it can do this regardless of what might be your annual salary. The numbers indicate that we as a country are people who are deeply in debt. Consider how that robs us of that sense of satisfaction of living in this present moment. You get your check. You've done your job well, so your check is your payment for a job well done. You stand there and you look at that check. What you could be feeling at that moment in time is a deep sense of satisfaction. You've worked hard. You've been paid. Now you have the opportunity to give, to save, to pay debts, to do some things to help someone else, to do something for yourself. And yet as you stand there looking at that check, you know that every penny of that check and more is going to go to just try to stay afloat. And at that moment in time, you're doing exactly what my professor said, living regretfully in the past. Why did I spend? I don't even know where all this went. Regretfully in the past or anxiously in the future, who am I going to not pay to make it this month? That's no way to live because that robs us 
of the joy of the moment. Jesus says, stop worrying about tomorrow. Your Father will provide, but there's a part you have to play. You have to understand what's truly important and what's not as important. You have to understand what's the best priority and what's not the best priority. And don't miss the joy of living in this moment. Jesus is no killjoy. I mean, when you read Jesus in his completeness, he's not a killjoy. He's not somebody who's saying you have to abandon the world and live in seclusion and isolation, an austere lifestyle. He doesn't say that. In fact, his self-righteous foes pointed at him and said, we have a problem with you. you, laugh, you you're parting too much, eating and drinking, laughing. Who knows what's going on? Jesus said, hey, John came one way, I come another. He didn't say you have to run from the world. In fact, his final prayer on the night before he was crucified, he said, Father, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world. No. But I do pray that you would keep them from the evil in the world. He did say that. He was concerned about real life in a real world. And I would suggest to you he was concerned about simple life. Because there in that sermon he preached, right at the heart of it, two roads. You can take the road of worry, complicated life. You can take the road of trust, simple life. If you want to take that road, you just have to understand what's truly important from what's not quite as important. You have to understand what good, godly priorities are. And you have to be willing to live in the here and now. But if we can learn those lessons, those simple lessons, it opens us up to live a robust life, a life in which we can exalt God, help others, and enjoy ourselves. And that, my friends, that is true, simple living.